by the way, Danny's really freaking strong. We were doing Hatfield squats and like blue, blue, blue. And I was going to be probably done after that. He's like, let's put another blue on. I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right. Almost got a hernia. And like, <laughs> Danny's like, another blue, right? I'm like, what? <laughs> Welcome to Coach Em Up. I'm Tim Riley. I'm joined here with Zach Zillner. What's up? As always. And we, I'm so excited about today. We were joined, uh, we were graced with Danny Foley. Danny, how's it going, dude? Doing well, man. Appreciate Uh, y'all having me. Dude, thank you for making the trip out. And um, I wish we could have spent more time hanging out. For sure. The 15 minutes that we got to hang out (laughs) before the pod, I was like, oh, Foley is a man after my own. We have a lot in common. In fact, we both have the same middle name, Patrick. Unforgivably Irish. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Fair skid, Patrick middle name. Dude, uh, I know who you are. Zach knows who you are. Uh, If people don't know who you are yet, I don't know where they've been. But for the people who don't know, can you give us the Danny Foley elevator pitch, how you got into training, your background, and then where you're at now? Yeah, man. Uh, I'm just a dude, <laughs> you know, <I> just <laughs> try to figure shit out. Um, <laughs> I, I got into strength and conditioning uh, about 11 years ago. Um, like most of us, I was a suck athlete, you know, not good enough to keep playing. So I wanted to do the thing that was closest to it. So I decided to start coaching, um, you know, kind of stumbled my way into VHP, which uh, really ended up becoming a transcendent stop for me. Um, and, uh, you know, actually this more directly to you than, than even the audience for this, but like that kind of preludes into what we'll get into here in this talk today. But when I showed up at BHP, I was 25. I was a strength and conditioning coach. I was coming out of five, three, one West side, you know, bang weights, you know, get fucking bigger and faster, stronger. Um, and we worked exclusively with Navy SEALs and Naval Special Warfare. And, you know, really it was it was quite literally, we got called in for a meeting on a Sunday and, hey, these athletes are out. This military program is starting up. We start tomorrow. Here's, wow. here's what the constraints are. And, um, you know, the, the gentleman who runs VHP, Alex Oliver, who uh, is just somebody who's always been, you know, just so incredibly great to me and, and done so many great things for me. Um, he, uh, who was, he was also a 26 year Navy SEAL and, um, he gave us a, a, a very clear instruction, right? So it was on the left, you have your left flank, you have your right flank. On the left, we don't get anybody hurt on our time. On the right, we establish trust early and often. Any other way that you go about it within those two flanks is fine by me. And I'm like, cool. No idea what I'm doing, but I can work with that. <laughs> Right. Got some boundaries. So, you know, VHP, we'll circle back around to it. But, you know, that was kind of my initial introduction to a big boy job, to a real job. And it was just the greatest experience of my life, man. Like all the dudes that I met through that program, all the people that I was able to work with, uh, just really, truly an incredible thing. About two years ago, we uh, decided to um, kind of take a jump, you know, and uh, we wanted to see uh, if we could take Rude Rock from being kind of our sidecar to our main thing. So of all places, we just kind of landed on Fort Worth, Texas. Um, didn't really have a plan. Wife was seven months pregnant. Jesus. Um, impeccable yeah. timing, impeccable. this guy. I mean, dude, the, 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 <laughs> fact that, the fact that she's still riding with me is incredible. Um, but, uh, you know, we just kind of showed up and hit the ground running. And, and I think, uh, and you guys are both similar in this way, like the, the way that I do best is punching my way out of a corner. Totally. You know, I don't, I don't want options. I don't want decisions. I just want to go. Yep. Uh, we were just mentioning it. And, you know, we got our ass beat last year. Yeah. Like it was brutal. Um, you know, really had a lot going on, trying to figure out how to be a dad, trying to figure out how to be married with a kid. You know, Nicole had to get another job because I had fucked everything up, basically. <laughs> shout out to Nicole, <laughs> honestly. Shout, shout out, out to, to Nicole. Nicole. Big shout, shout out to out. Nicole. Put the team um, on her back, dude. She, she does it all, man. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. So it, it, it was it was a long period of time, or what felt like a long period of time, you know, the better part of a year, just kind of operating out of desperation and just doing whatever became available to totally. me. So um, that led to training out of three facilities last summer with no air conditioning at any of them in 120 degree heat. That led to thousand miles a week on average of driving, which I'm still kind of doing. Um, <laughs> it led to a complete lack of stability. I was fired from eight gyms in 10 months. Um, and, and we just kept turning the wheel and, wow. you know, all the way through that time, it was, it was still fun. And that was the, the kind of the recognition point for me was like, you know, I'm definitely somebody who just wants to fucking go and yeah. figure things out. You know, I don't need really anything. I just need autonomy. 
I need opportunity and I need discretion about what I'm doing. So that ultimately kind of led us to this point now, man. And, you know, and I'll be very candid in saying like the last six months have been very, very good to me. We're off to a really good start this year. We've had a lot of really cool things going on. I've been uh, extremely grateful with with being able to link up with a lot of different people and um, do some cool things, get involved with some different organizations. And as of most recently, I just uh, started up at the Sports Academy up in Frisco. Um, where I'm coming on as a contractor for return to play and injury management cases. God, so fucking cool. Man. Can you go and do a uh, rude rock kind of the idea of it, where it started and where it's going? I would love to, man. Um, 2018, and uh, you know, I was I was at that uh, I was at VHP and uh, a, a previous employer, not Alex, the guy I was mentioning, but um, I had done all this work uh, in in complete silence for about three or four months, right? And we have this cool program going and we're building this thing out and it's still brand new. And I'm like, hey, we don't have any kind of like articles or like informative content. We don't have an exercise library. Like we're handing dudes like photocopied sheets. It felt like it was like fucking 1997. Yeah. What are we doing? You know? Don't lose your sheet. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm like, man, we can do better than this. So I in complete <clears throat> silence. I just start writing out articles. Like I wrote out like 10 articles and I put together this exercise library with over 500 videos in it. Um, and then we put, get, put together remote programs and I'd classified them and colored them and everything. And I take him in like a kid on Christmas. I'm like, oh, I'm about to be the fucking man. Like, this <laughs> is going to be the greatest shit ever. And we sit down and I handed him the thing and I told him my idea. And he kind of sat back and looked at me and was like, eh, we're not going to do that. Wow. I'm like, whoa, OK, how come? Didn't really give me a reason. I was like, all right, well, this is going to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So quite literally on my drive home, I was like, OK, we're going to start a business. What are we going to name it? I'm like fully strang. I'm like, nah, fuck that. That's stupid. And like, ah, huh. Rudy and Rocky. Okay. Rude rock strength. There we go. Wow. So it's after my two dogs, um, one who's since passed, but one who's still with us. And, um, and I, I never really anticipated on it being a primary business. I really didn't at the time. I just figured it would just be some small little operation where I could just get my shit off, write some articles, put some videos up. And, you know, once again, one thing led to another. And then, you know, all of a sudden, four or five years later, like we're we're a business now. You know, this is this is a business now. Um, so it's no longer fun. And now <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Like, yeah. You know, but that was uh -huh. actually, and the stakes that was are actually, higher <laughs> now. And yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> but that was actually the origin story. And um, and you know, with us moving to Texas, man, it was just us kind of doubling down and saying, like, hey, if we're gonna do this, let's do this. I would ten out of ten times rather fail miserably than than succeed passively. Yeah. You know what I, when you were talking, first of all, if you're listening to this and that doesn't get you fucking hyped up and ready to run through a wall, <laughs> turn it off now. Literally, this is go find another fucking show, dude. <laughs> this one isn't for you. Um, fucking right, Danny. I, I just resonate with so much of everything you said. And um, I also had a moment you were talking about being at VHP. I just had a total fucking epiphany. I've seen you on their Instagram page for fucking years and I'm just having the realization of you performing all these exercises yeah. and doing demos of exercises yeah. and posting a shit ton of content on their page, yeah. correct? Am yeah. I not right? Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, when you were talking and saying that you were at VIP, it was like, it struck me like a light. It took everything in my ADHD body <laughs> not to fucking interrupt you. I remember you. you. I really oh, fuck, dude. I know who you are, dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so that, I just had a minute it's your full circle moment that was very cool um dude we got a lot to cover today we do i think um zach do you have anything pressing right now you want no, to i think we do all right so it. all right dude um we talked off air about this and i i think it probably makes a ton of sense to go into the talk the fascia conversation um and like lay out real quick for the people who don't know or aren't up on game like what is fascia what's its role in the body just all the quick points and let's get through that and then we can get into the shit cool and why'd you get into it because a lot of people like strength conditioning you five through one like you mentioned earlier like right what got you down the rabbit hole of all things fascia so <laughs> it, it it does tie back to that time at vhp and and again man like i was i was wide-eyed and green i didn't know shit about shit right yeah. so it in in my mind as a recent graduate strength and conditioning i lifted heavy we push press we bench we squat we deadlift we clean we run that's what we do right mm -hmm. and it didn't work and and you didn't need to be even remotely an expert to understand that that was not going to work yeah. right now the the constructs of that program were very specific but 
to the parts that I can speak on, we did train them twice a day, right? So we had everyone from a, a 25 year old operator who was getting ready to work up and go somewhere mm -hmm. all the way up to an 80 year old person, 80 year old vet with, with cancer and, and, wow. you know, Parkinson's disease. Right. And, and so we would have, I'd have four hours in the morning, break for two hours and then four hours in the afternoon. And in that four hour window, we can see both ends and anything in between. Uh, amputations, uh, all the kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. So you didn't need to be an expert to suggest, okay, we're not doing 531. <laughs> but when you work with that population and when you work for an individual that like Alex, you don't fail, you figure this shit out, mm -hmm. right? So we had to kind of like break everything down and and I, I can't even tell this story without, you know, giving a tremendous amount of credit to Tim Kelly, who was kind of my right hand man along the way. And we would just really get into the weeds on like, how do we do strength and conditioning that isn't strength and conditioning? Because I didn't have, you know, a manual therapy license at the time. We had additional components and modalities that were supporting what we were doing, mm -hmm. but we had to fill two hours a day, five days a week. So what we started to recognize was that when you look at the origins of strength and conditioning, everything is basically extracted from powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting and track and field. We can trace this back to about the early 60s, right? All of those things were independent things. Right. Right? Yep. So none of those origin points were specifically developed for the sake of athletic performance. Now, along the way, we've had so many great people that have tailored it more towards sports performance um, and also injury restoration. But my point is that we just adopted these things, jammed them together, and then said, hey, if you're a strength and condition, if you're CSCS, this is what the fuck you do. Mm -hmm. And I will detest that until the day that I die. <laughs> because we've proven, conclusively, we've proven, and we had objective measures to include, you know, like legitimate body scans, all the things, right? That not only were we taking guys and girls out of pain, like canceling surgeries type of way, but we were also adding I had a dude who added 18 pounds of muscle in four weeks. Mm. We had dudes that would lose 20 pounds in four weeks. So it did all the same shit right. that we intend for our conventional strength and conditioning to do, but it didn't look like that. So the way that I've kind of termed that to be is like, it's a different perspective, not a different practice. Mm. And because I was so fortunate to have that group as my primary first introduction, that was what became normal to me, right? So doubling back now, when we get to this point where I'm in, you know, Texas back with the athletes, this past two years has been this process of recalibrating that, right? And I came down here thinking like, oh shit, like I'm gonna have this massive learning curve. I'm gonna have to learn how to do combine prep. I'm gonna have to learn how to do, nope. Nope, this is very much needed. Why? Because they play a fucking extremely violent game. Yeah. And they all get fucked up and they all have major surgeries at the end of every season. And they're all thoroughbreds. Yep they are all at a point if you're 25 and up and you're in the league bro we're not really going to make anybody faster or stronger in a measurable sense we'll retain it and we may peak some things here and there of course but what about if we just gave them them a better physical platform to stand on to go express the skills of their sport so what if i can help get you to a second contract just because you can do what you can do and i'm going to help you from fucking regressing physically along the way so now we look at it and we're like, okay, well, we're going to squat, but we're not going to bilateral squat. We're going to split squat because that's more conducive to the philosophy or the perspective of anatomy that I've, I've developed over the years. We're still going to clean and snatch. We're just going to catch in a split. So it's all the same like X's and O's. It mm -hmm. just gets portrayed or, or executed slightly differently. And that's really where I'm at now is like, okay, how do we keep turning that wheel? How can this be something that can be adaptable to a performance or a developmental athlete? How can this fit for a veteran athlete who's got six years in the game? How can this be applied to directly return to play and, and, and injury restoration? Mm -hmm. So those latter two, I've got a pretty good blueprint on that, decent. This one, still figuring it out, but I think it fits pretty well within that. And there's still you know time for me to kind of figure that part out. Who are some of the people that help like influence this new way of thinking? I mean, you mentioned Tim Kelly, but like, what are some of the articles, books, other people you've reached out to to kind of inspire this new age wave of thinking? So Stu McMillan means the world to me um, on, a, on a personal level, on a professional level. Uh, he, he is just somebody who I've looked at for 10 years and just said, hey, that's that's who I would want to be. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like that's in within the field, right? Like right. within the work aspect. Right. Um, Stu's a great dude too, but <laughs> off the yeah. field. To be, to be clear, yeah, <laughs> Stu's a great dude, but yeah. I, don't, I don't look up to anybody other than my dad yeah. in that regard. There you go. Um, but no, he's just been such a, a, a tremendous figure within this field, and and he's somebody that. <laughs> For, for so many years has just done so many different things and continued to just develop this work archive that's incredibly robust. So Altus, Stu McMillan, obviously that includes Dan Pfaff as well. Um, it, those are my gold standard people. So for, for my intent and purposes, I don't do shit with track and field athletes, but I can take those concepts that they utilize and those philosophies that they ascribe to, mm -hmm. and then I can adopt them and then kind of just put them in motion for my thing, right? right. So I would say that's definitely number one. There's a long list of people that, you know, I've, I've definitely gotten shit from. If we're going to kind of stay more on that fascial side. So for like sure. the anatomy side, like Tom Myers is great. Anatomy trains is great. I think it lacks a lot of functionality and I think it's a little bit too over the top for my liking. Um, that was a hard read. I dude. didn't get through it. Yeah, Fuck, yeah, yeah, I got, yeah. I got, I think, Tough. honest to God, I may have gotten maybe halfway through. Yeah. And I was like, I can't. Well, and then there's another one called Biotensegrity by Graham Scar. And I swear to God, I, I read 30 pages and didn't even retain a word. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I failed what college algebra. Bro, I failed college algebra three yeah. times. You're talking about <laughs> Wrong Green guy. You and me, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, Algebra's hard, man. It's kind of so slack. Yeah, listen, first of all, yeah, you're in the, the right room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, the Stecco organization, so Carla, Antonio, Luigi, uh, they're based out of Spain. They do a tremendous job with like, comprehensive fascial anatomy that's real science, real anatomy. So I would say that they're probably at the top there. Um, and then I would say there's a host of others. There's, there's a lot of people doing really good things. I tend to gravitate towards the dynamic correspondence, the, your boy Corey, you know, I love the way that, that Corey trains people. I love what you guys do. And, and I think that, you know, for my sake right now, it's like, I'm trying to like, kind of recalibrate what I've done and what I think is the right way to do it. But yeah. I need to learn from people like you because I don't understand the nuance of sport. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning the ins and outs of the off season cycles and camps coming up and in season models and things like that. So I'm trying to figure out what does a high level conventional sport performance off season model look like, which I think you do a fantastic job Thank of. Thank you. And then how do I take that and play a support role to it? Because I'm never going to do that. That's not what I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm in a space now where I'm going to be an adjunct to people who are doing similar things. Totally. And now I'm trying to fit into that model and then provide something of value. Yeah. And God, Sports Academy, what a fucking sweet place to be doing it, dude. I mean, wow. Yeah, it is the nicest facility I've ever <laughs> set foot in. so incredible, yeah. dude. Yeah. And let me Shout out Mo Wells. <laughs> Shout out the guy Mo Wells. And let me say too, man, uh, the, the people there have been tremendous, like yeah. extremely welcoming, very open Brian Buck is there too, isn't he? Brian Buck. The, what do we call him? The hottest guy in SNC. The hottest yeah. guy in SNC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that beautiful We're bit. tied for second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> beautiful <laughs> bitch. <laughs> Brian, that's big love. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, man, some incredible people in there doing really, really good things. And, and, you know, and again, this isn't to like shit on anybody that I've been working with or worked with in the past year or so, but like, truth be told, it's the first facility that I've gotten into where I'm like, okay, this is big league. Like, this yeah. is what it looks like. This is what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. This is a well-oiled machine. And I feel like I can be a part of this. Hell yeah, man. So fascial training, you mentioned that. Can you kind of dive into that? I know that's kind of when I think of fascial training, you're the first person I think of. Maybe I just don't know that many people. Um, <laughs> well, see, now that's funny because I'm the opposite. Really? Like when I think when I hear fat, just in this is I'm kind of a, a pessimist. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want things to work out, but I don't ever think they're gonna kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, when I th when I see fascia, I see fucking naughty fucking swing in a man. I don't even, I see, maybe I, think, I just don't know. I go anything. to the dumb shit, even though I know in my heart that that's not the, the context of the conversation we're having here. Right. But I just, I'm kind of negative, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's I why enjoy I made it. this drive. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> yeah. why I'm sitting in this chair. So my first yeah. exposure to fascia training was Danny emailed me or DM'd me and was like going around the country, visiting people, all this stuff. I'm like, great, another coach wants to <laughs> hop in. And then I think you visited Hootie before you visited me. I did, yeah. And she <laughs> called me and was like, yo, I had this guy come up, Danny Foley, like he's great. Blah, blah. And she, if she likes you, then you're doing something right. 
And I was like, oh shit, that's the dude that messaged me. Like maybe I'll have him have a minute. <laughs> so I had him in and I was like, dude, what do you do? But I just explained everything, you know, tweaking. We worked out together, yeah. tweaking. By the way, Danny's really freaking strong. Well, I saw this motherfucker doing single leg hops. Yeah. He was doing like a drop catch situation. Yeah, it's, it's next Parent level. Hops. And he, I, I turned and looked and this some bitch hopped halfway across the 20 yard yeah. turf and like four hops. Well, he came in and Corey and I, he wanted to train as like sweet as like tall skinny guy. I'm short, stocky. We got this. This. And Danny's like, we're doing Hatfield squats. I'm like, blue, blue, blue. And I was going to be probably done after that. He's like, let's put another blue on. I'm like, all right. <laughs> all right. And I almost got a hernia. And he's, like, <laughs> and he's like, another blue, right? I'm like, what? And he ended up putting weight. Corey and I were just watching him. We're like, wow, this guy talks the talk, walks the walk. <laughs> but he was like sharing basically nuances of adjusting certain exercise and everything. And I'm like, yo, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, but yeah, that's why I correlate fascial training with, with Danny. So, and to piggyback off, we got sidetracked there, but to piggyback off of Zach's original question before I derailed us, um, is uh, we, you talked a bit about how you got into yeah. the fascial realm experiences and stuff. Can we go through just like real quickly, what is fascia? And what's his purpose in the bot and just all the, the things so that everyone listening can at least get their foot in the door for the conversation. Yeah. And then we're going to. Yeah, no, it, but it is important, man. And like and, you know, it, I, I, I'm facetious, but at the same time, there is, you know, some level of efficacy for me to to bring a more appropriate and professional discussion around this, because like, dude, it's crazy, man. Like I have I had somebody return a program, uh, which is wild like you purchased an online program <laughs> you, <laughs> you did it and now yeah. you made a refund yeah, whatever but the here's your hundred bucks was, dude literally no yeah, refund bro uh, <laughs> i want to start doing that to no refunds. yeah but it, it was uh but it was my fascial based training program right and the reason why he returned it was because it wasn't fascial specific enough right so there are people that are way yeah, on this yeah. end and then there are people that are way on this end right and I'm just kind of indifferent. Right. I'm I'm about what works. I'm solution. Speaking my language, baby. You know? And if that means that we do a little bit more of this or we do a little bit more of that, I don't give a shit. And it was, again, we had this conversation this morning. Like, so I'm in the process of doing my LMT right now. And I want to maintain being a strength coach front and center and then utilize the LMT when it's necessary or when it's going to help expedite my work. That's it. Right? So yep. just being pragmatic. But to get to the point here. The, the important thing to understand first and foremost is that fascia is connective tissue and connective tissue represents roughly about 40 to 45 percent of our protein tissue mass. Right. So it's a lot. Mm -hmm. OK. As strength and conditioning coaches, we have been completely gridlocked and zealots to musculoskeletal loading. Get bigger, get faster, get strong. It represents 90 percent of our industry. Right. Mm -hmm. While we have done a tremendous job on the performance side over the last 20 years and with all the developments of technology and bio tracking and all these different things, the injury rates are fucking skyrocketing. Yeah. So we're not doing something right. Yeah. Right. That's conclusive to me. We're figuring out how to make people move faster, be more explosive, be stronger, but we can't fucking manage it. So that's a problem. Right. So we get back to fascia. Fascia is a connective tissue. It is a dynamic, global, epimuscular connective tissue that is essentially throughout the entire body. But although it is, you know, all connected, so to speak, it is not uniformed in its viscoelastic properties or in its densities. OK, so if we think about it like this, we have a muscle, we have a tendon, mm -hmm. then we have bones. The fascia is essentially going to envelop around the muscle belly, but then also in between muscle fibers, there is fascial tissue that essentially creates connection between the fibers, mm -hmm. okay? Then we have aponeurotic fascia, which is essentially a broadening or an expansion of the tendinous tissue. So this is why we have fascia like the IT band, right? Yes. Very dense, very fibrous, you know, it doesn't really give too much. And then we have the uh, the fascia that covers the abdominal area that is very thin, very membranous, and has a lot of give and pliability to it. Mm -hmm. So what the fascial tissue essentially does is it plays an inherent support role for musculoskeletal tissue. I'm getting a little bit long-winded, but I got to get this point across too. I went to a dissection course in Colorado three years ago, uh, the Anatomy Trains Dissection course, and it was wow. a five-day course. Let me tell you, it was fuck all the professional side. It was a cathartic experience 
to, to, to do that. And I can't encourage anybody highly enough to go do it. I remember wanting to do that, but I was like, it's like $12,000. And at the time, <laughs> I just had my kid and, you know, listen, we were talking about daycare, uh, failing daycare. algebra class yeah. and all that stuff. It took me a while to get yeah. to where I'm at. That's yeah. all I'm saying. No, but hey, find a way, man, because it was, it was truly special and it is not fascia down your throat. It is literally like your own project. So like we get Fuck. little cohorts, we're at a table and here's the biggest difference. The difference is that in the university setting, when you do your cadaveric labs, the bodies are all fucked up, they're all mangled up, it's all different shades of gray and yellow, it's seven semesters in, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And importantly, they've been dumped in formaldehyde, they've been dumped in embalming fluid, they've been chemicalized and preserved. Don't quote me on this number, but it's something like 88 or 90% or something of academic research that is conducted in the United States is an extension of cadaveric research that has bodies that have been dumped in formaldehyde, embalmed and chemicalized. So from that point forward, we are not getting an accurate representation yeah. of what the body looks like, not even to mention when it's actually live tissue, right? Because right. it completely evaporates the fluid, which denigrates the, the fascial tissue. Mm -hmm. So back to Colorado, these bodies were fully skinned. Some of them were like less than two weeks, right? Oh, now, obviously, wow. now, obviously, this is a dedicated program that people, yeah. which I'm actually going to do as well, that people sign up for, and it, it's very much real, right? So we spent the first day just de-skinning the body, Second day we worked down, and then this is where we kind of go into our special interest project. <laughs> it's so wild. Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. Um, and so now we get to the tissue, and and I'm like, like this is it, bro. Like this is the moment. You know, is this fascial shit real, or are you full of shit? Like, right. what's going on here? And let me tell you, it is absolutely real. It is a tangible tissue that we have had in our biology throughout evolution, and we have had medical records that trace back four or five hundred years that are actually pretty frighteningly accurate that show or demonstrate a recognition of the fascial tissue. Now, the problem became they didn't understand the functionality to it. So it just got listed as this packer, packing filler tissue. It's an right. inert tissue. They just discard it. Yeah, right? just packing But we knew peanuts. it was there, right? right? So now I'm in this class and, and I have uh, this, this woman is, is uh, prone on the table and I'm working down the, the thigh compartment, posterior thigh compartment. And we, we remove kind of some of the fatty tissue and, and I saw it and I'll never forget it ever it, it was powerful right and and i'm like oh my god okay it is real it's mm -hmm. a real thing and you can feel it and when you kind of like put your instruments to it like there's so much like give to it and it's like highly malleable but it's very very like stiff and and structured and then when we went a layer deeper and i cut that fascial tissue that superficial fascial tissue the three hamstring muscles go <laughs> fall to the table like one little incision down the middle of the back of the thigh and the hamstrings just unraveled. Whoa. So right then and there, I'm like, okay, if it does nothing else, it, it plays a support and a structural continuity role in the body. And for that reason, I'm going to double down on this. Yeah. So that was really the, the moment for me where I was like, okay, fascia's legit. That's totally fucking powerful, dude. And you know what? The other thing, as you were talking, I was like, you you do bicep curls, you know what I mean? You people you can see like my bicep yeah. is yeah. working, right? Um, or like I I know like if I have tendon pain, like there's this thing. It's, it's it feels more tangible. Whereas like when you're at least most people when you're training or moving or operating, nothing ever gets associated, or there's no real visual way for most people to see fascia as playing a role in that movement. Because from what I'm hearing from you is like it's it's completely it innervates everything and it plays a structural role and everything and it has different kinds of qualities. Whereas like a tendon and a muscle, it's kind of binary. Yes. It's binary. Yeah. It's black and white. And so it's easier it is. to 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 consume and and to understand what's happening at that level. Without a doubt. And I and I completely understand that sentiment. It is it is a vexing tissue. And and that's a part of the problem that we've had is that it is very difficult to study, namely because of what I mentioned about the embalmment process, but right. then also too because it's it's fluid based. It's mm -hmm. there's it's like kind of situated in between adipose tissue and, and layers of fat and and it's in between muscle fibers and it's gluey and it's greasy. So it's very difficult to measure and, and you know, really, t truth be told, like academic researchers are behind the curve on this yeah. because of everything that we just mentioned previously. But, you know, to get uh, to give you a good example on this, though, too, I also, number one, 
I question every single piece of research that was done that a tendon was tetanized on or that the chemical or the body was chemicalized or embalmed or that we had mice or that we I question all that shit because how accurate is that at the end of the day? Now, I'm not trying to split hairs on that shit, but it's like we are so quick to say, well, we can't see it. It's not, it, you know, we can't feel it. So is fascia even, re- well, you know, you, you, you're you going, you're basing your entire industry, your entire, entire work um, aptitude off of research that has been pretty fucking faulty. Right. So why are you so comfortable with that? But this is just like witchcraft. And so, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. Like, well, it, I just think there's a lot of gray. Totally. And it's like, there are so, I'll just take it on like a, on the micro level with me. There are things I do in training. The only reason I do them is because I fucking like them. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I feel like people are afraid to say that. It's just like, yeah. I like no, this. 100%. Or my guys feel better when we just do that thing. So if just that, just take that logic yeah. and follow that, tease that out a little bit, you know, and and maybe you can kind of open your mind to something that perhaps you don't quite fully understand. Well, so now let's bridge some gaps here. So like I, I, I am, my muse is why are non-contact soft tissue injuries skyrocketing with no perceived end at the moment, right? And it's across all levels, it's across all sports, and we can't figure this thing out. And obviously it's a fucking multivariant problem, but in my mind, the training is, absolutely one of those primary variables, Mm. right? So if we see changes in training dramatically over the last 10 years, and there is a consistent rise in soft tissue injuries, maybe we did a little too much or we're not doing enough of this or that, but in either case, we got to reconfigure this thing out, Mm. right? We got to, we got to break this thing down. So with the fascial side of this, if we think about the directionality of forces. Mm -hmm. So we think about longitudinal force expression. I put force in the ground, ground puts force back into my foot, up my Achilles, and then up the rest of the kinetic chain. Okay, now what about the lateralization of force? So what about when we add rotation to it? What about when we add angles to it? What about if we add faulty surface to it? What, Mm -hmm. all these different variables, right? Soft tissue injuries don't occur because of an overload of force. They occur because the force is applied faster than the body is able to respond to it. So all of these people out here that are just so fucking gung ho about force, 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 force. (laughs) Well, if that were the fucking case, then the all American powerlifting team would be the starting offensive line for the fucking Kansas City Chiefs. Right. Speed and skill is the end of the day for us. Yeah. Across all measures. Now, if we have 12, 14, 16 year olds that, you know, fucking walking like giraffes and just getting into training. Yeah, go squat them, bench them, run them, you know, whatever. Like, it, whatever's fine. Mm-hmm. But then it does hit a point where there is a sophistication to what we do, and there's a definite complexity to it. And when we look at the injury side, I think that there's even more complexity to it and figuring out why this happened, what we need to do, and then how can we be somewhat preventative moving forward? Mm-hmm. How can we create better durability while still addressing power, speed, strength, blah, blah, blah? That's what I want to try to figure out. And I think that the lateralization of force is a major factor for this. Because if we use the Achilles tendon as the example with that longitudinal force expression, if I'm extremely robust in a sagittal plane or purely in a vertical direction, (laughs) (laughs) what happens if I'm nudged and my foot position changes and then I'm supposed to express that same level of force? Am I able to do that? And if that's not reflected in training, I don't think that that answer is yes. Mm -hmm right? At least not with some level of vulnerability to that action. So this is where we start to think about, okay, well, if we have this nonlinear kind of, you know, wrapping and encircling connective tissue that kind of ties some things together, different to, okay, well, what if we just start training in more planes? So instead of doing a fucking lunge where I'm just going forward the whole time, take different steps. Okay. Now this set, let's keep our heels off the ground. Now this set, let's put our heel down. Now let's hold it here. Let's hold it here. Yeah. The ultimate weapon for athletes or the ultimate trait for athletes is the ability to tolerate variability. So in my opinion or in my mind, especially once athletes have gotten to the point where they've established what that, you know, proverbial strong enough point is, okay, now we need to diversify that shit. Mm. Now we need to be able to utilize that same level of force, that same level of speed or that same level of whatever, and then do it in a multitude of ways instead of trying to squeeze out just a little bit more drops on that 485 back squat. How do we get to 495? I mean, (laughs) fuck. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know? So at what point, like with athletes, I mean, I was talking about like strong enough. 
and all these things. Like, <laughs> at what point would you start introducing this stuff with like a 13 year old all the way up to, you know, a 35 year old? Yeah, for sure, man. So, uh, two things. One, I think instead of how strong is strong enough, I think we need to supplement that for how is strength defined. And this is actually something that I adopted Amen. from Corey, from what we we talked about in October or whenever. How is strength defined? And that story that he uses is the perfect example of it. It's like basketball player, 6'10", 180 pounds, can't back squat 225, but the dude's fucking multi-time all-star, MVP, wins, I mean like, so is he not strong enough? Well, maybe we go watch him do something that's a little bit more fucking specific to basketball and all of a sudden, He's blowing everybody else out of the yeah, water. Yeah, maybe that mid thigh pull is uh, pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. You know. So, to me, it, it's much more about how is strength defined, and I think that there's a, a very broad answer, multiple answers for that, depending on who the situation or the, who the population is or what the situation is. But generally speaking, for me, the athlete's strength is their archetype. So, if there's somebody who's classified as more of a force mover, then their strength is being strong. Keep them strong. Mm -hmm. If their archetype is more elastic or more fashionably driven, then we don't need to be adding 10 pounds in two weeks. We don't need to add force to that. We need to keep their strength their strength. Then we have outliers who do everything great. So yeah. we just manage the ratios, don't let them get worse. And then we have hybrids who don't do either great. So we just kind of improve both of them. Mm -hmm. So that would really be the first part. The second part going from 13 to 35 for, fuck, I don't know if this is the case anymore, but like for the most part, kids are doing their fascial based training by playing yeah mm -hmm. right go play yeah like get the ones a, that are playing more yeah, than get, one get in a maybe. fight yeah get in a fight fall, fall off your bike <laughs> yeah climb a fucking tree go right. jump in a river right like you're doing stuff yeah because a big part of fascial tissue development is proprioceptive acuity so how your body is able to sense and detect where you are in space and then how you're going to organize and connect patterns from that point and the best way to do that is through play yeah right now as we get older there's a little, well, there's obviously less play. Um, <laughs> well, for some of us, yeah, right. um, yeah. <laughs> it does suck. Yeah, it does suck. Um, but there's also biological regression that we need to kind of take into consideration here. So number one is the juice worth the squeeze. And this is just a way of, of kind of playing on the threshold for adaptation. So we go back to that case of like, dude's 28, been in the league for five years. <sighs> he squats what he squats. Hmm. We'll touch that. We'll yeah. hit that. That is a part of our planning. But the majority of what I'm focused on is not regressing and then improvability to tolerate variability. Mm -hmm. The other factor is that as we get older, we need more preventative maintenance, right? And this is really the, the big push behind why I'm doing my, my LMT. Because we look at, at, at things like manual therapy or, or, or all the modalities as, as being reactive or responsive. I sprained my ankle or I pulled my calf, so I need to go see the, the AT or I need to go see the LMT. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. You need to do those things up front because those things potentiate an optimal window to apply stress. So if you and I are getting ready to go out and run sprints, you kind of still look like you got the, the sprint fucking weapon right <laughs> now. With you, so I'm going to exclude you from this. <laughs> yeah, if, if you and I right now got up and, and and we had to go race an 80 yards uh rate race um pretty decent chance one of us is going to come out of there banged up probably yeah. right just right now get up and go but if you're 19 you can be fucking hung over you didn't sleep the night before uh, how many you want me to do yeah right. right so this degradation of connective tissue is what we need to kind of start to focus on and manage as we go along and that's where i come back around and say hey listen like all of this, you know, the, again, the hands-on stuff, the foam rolling, the flow patterns, the different stretching patterns, FRC concepts, those things aren't solving problems. Load and velocity solve problems. But if you can't do load and velocity proficiently, mm -hmm. then you need to do these supporting things that help potentiate the opportunity to apply stress and velocity. Coach Em Up is proud to be sponsored by Plyomat. Plyomat is a jump mat that measures ground contact times, vertical jump height, and reactive strength index. Plyomat's trusted by over 750 coaches in 25 different countries. It's something that you can use in training day in and day out to give immediate feedback and drive output and intent. Plyomat's always in stock. When you order your Plyomat, you can get it with one to three business days and start your training immediately. If you get a group of athletes challenging each other to jump higher, get off the ground quicker, get 
transforms that workout into a highly competitive, highly potent stimulus. If you would like access to the best jump mat on the planet, use Coach em Up 5 to get 5% off at checkout. Again, code Coach em Up 5 for 5% off. Come jump with us, get a plow mat. The Coach em Up podcast is sponsored by Squat Wedgies. Tim, what are Squat Wedgies? Squat Wedgies are an adjustable squat wedge, 7, 13, and 20 degrees. It's big enough to elevate your whole foot and not just your heel. Because it's rubber, it doesn't slide on surfaces. It's 22 pounds, so it's durable and stable enough for even your biggest athletes. There's a 90-day risk-free trial. The shipping is free and get 15% off squat wedgies with our discount code, Coach em Up 15 Coach em Up 15 for 15% off of the best squat wedge on the planet. With like movement variability or like different exercise selection, like how often are you training these? Are they week to week? Could you use the same ones for like, you know, your four b week block or are you changing yeah. them daily? What, what kind yeah. of stuff? Bro, I, it probably looks very similar to your shit. We, you and I have a very, very compatible training approach. I would say that for me, I work mostly off of two to four week cycles. My primary block is going to stay pretty consistent. So I'm, I'm probably going to work whatever my primary is with an overload progression scheme. Uh, usually I follow a conjugate model with most of the people that I'm working with. We're going to pair that with either a plyo or a long duration ISO. Or so whatever. go into that. Like yeah. you actually, Danny actually lifts his athletes. So like <laughs> what would be a like mock day? Like, let's say it's like a lower body strength day. We'll make okay. it easy. Like what would be your theme for the day? Yeah. Um, so let's, let's say we have a, a squat day. So first thing Fuck is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the more, answer, tell me dude. more. <laughs> Well, before you get excited. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So first thing is is, is movement and tissue prep. Um, so I work off of generally three to four blocks, depending on the time allotment that I have. Those blocks are going to be governed by time, not sets. So for me, usually my blocks are going to be about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, in, in luxury cases, I'll get 30. Um, but tissue and movement prep is exactly what it sounds. Some table stuff, some spring ankles, some foot stuff, some dynamics, feeling it out. I'm using this as kind of an iterative process. And this is again, another, you know, just philosophy that I've adopted from Altus where, um, you know, the warm up needs to be very, very interactive and it should be iterative. iterative. So meaning I, I have a, a baseline and an intake that, I, that I'm referencing from as we go through this training cycle and I'm comparing today to then, and then I'm comparing today to, to, to today, right? So we go through spring ankle series. They say, hey, left calf feels a little bit tight. Okay, cool, let's come over here, bop, bop, bop. We go back, does that feel better or worse? Boom, 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 we go through. If it's a squat day, I'm gonna do something for extension and I'm gonna do something for flexion. Then we get into the primary block. Primary block is gonna be um, either a safety bar or a Hatfield split squat. Um, what phase or what cycle are we in here? We in- uh, You pick. All right, let's go power. So we are doing Lord. threes um, and we're gonna be at 67 or 65%. And we're going to pair that with a single leg lateral drop jump into a single leg double bound. So we'll work however many sets that we can get with a fixed rest time within that time allotment. So if I see regression in speed, if I see compensation in pattern, or if I see pain or discomfort, we're going to go ahead and shut it down Tight. or we'll bring it back down. Right. Mm -hmm. And then kind of feed it through. Block two is a hybrid. So block two is really where if somebody, it, let's just keep the theme here. We're in a power phase, so we're kind of close to season. So we're kind of getting ready to go. So that to me is block two needs to kind of be another one that's a heavy hitter. So we're going to do an impulse lunge. So if we started with a safety bar, Hatfield, 65%, threes each side. Now we're going to go to a hand or a um, non-hand supported um, safety bar and we're going to do an impulse lunge. So for this, I really like, we're going to kind of stab back good load on the plantar or on the plantar fascia, good load on the Achilles tendon and calf complex. And then we're gonna spring forward and have a rapid decel on that front side. And then we're gonna pair that with either a jump or a throw. So it's lift, jump, lift, jump, or lift, jump, lift, throw. We go through that 15 to 20 minutes, we come down to block three. Now this is where it does get a little bit different, right? So where I'm pursuing overload and I'm thinking predominantly muscular tendinous adaptations in block one and in this case, block two, mm -hmm. in block three, now I'm thinking about that pursuit of variability. So this is where it just kind of gets a little bit more open. And if we're doing a leg day, if we're doing a lower body day, um, you know, this is gonna be some combination of step ups, some combination of rear foot, front foot, some combination of lateral, some combination of crossover. We'll do some kind of bridging. We'll do some kind of speed on, or, you know, speed on sled. Um, and basically just be uh, kind of crafty as we go through that, right? And with my pro athletes and with my athletes who have a really good robust training history, I want that to be kind of back and forth, you know? 
hey, what'd you think about how we did that last one? Eh, I felt goofy as shit. Okay, hey, you take ownership. Here's what your parameters are. Let's see how it looks when we do it that way. And then we fill in or we kind of feed into that. Oh, shit, that did look better. Okay, let's do it like this now. And then we kind of go back and forth. But, you know, at the end of the session, too, I, I think I want, I'm want i trying to focus on, like, keeping their concentration and, and, and kind of their investment in the session. I was just about to say You know, that. And, and what I've noticed in the past is, like, is if I'm not very deliberate about that, that's, that third block will just lead into bullshit. We'll just start talking <laughs> yeah. about what's on Sports Center or whatever, whatever, right? Yeah. So, like, I just, without being, a, you know, like, overbearing like come on sure. we gotta push we got like <laughs> yeah you know just get them interested like what'd you feel okay and that's another thing too like one of my uh, you know inherent evaluators is trying to close the gap between what the athlete feels and then what i observe right and when you have young athletes who suck at everything i'm back here like holy shit this looks awful and in their head they're like i'm a stud and i'm like okay <laughs> we gotta we got to close the, the gap. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you get to the when you get to the more advanced or the more senior athletes, right? It's almost the opposite. It's like I'll sit there and be like, "Damn, bro, that looked really good." Ah, I felt like shit. Yeah. Okay, tell me more. Yeah. Well, blah 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 blah. All right. So then now I just got some notes out of that, and then we're gonna get some, you know, kind of corrective on this, and then boom, now we're back and we do it this way. So that's where the 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 fascial component kind of comes into play, where like. Load is not in my mind at block three. Very, very rarely. I'm never. You'll never catch me. Okay, three sets of eight dumbbell bilateral RDL, three tempo down. Tuck your chin, rigid spine. It's never going to happen for me. So you're getting your variability basically in the warm up, and then yes. towards the end, like yes. your. So it's, like, it's like a. It's like a, it's it's a sandwich effectively, yeah. right? Variability, like, yes. constant variability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I'll I'll mention him too, uh, Nick Sheminick, who's one of my uh, good but real good friends. He's and, got good stuff. And he's he's uh, we we share an athlete or two together, and um, you know we kind of see it as like he's the machete and I'm the scalpel. So for him, it's like a lot of this like kind of organized play, a lot of animal patterns, a lot of flow patterns. And for him, he gave me a really good nugget. And you'll like this one um, last summer when we were working with with this dude. And uh, he said, the way you focus on fascia is the way I focus on competition. And I was like, fuck yeah. Hell yeah, dude. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, we're going to work good together. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, because he he's just about, let's just fucking go. Let's yeah. just go hard. Let's sweat. Fuck the air conditioning. We're going to get in it. Mm -hmm. and, and it creates a really good product because even if we want to nitpick about exercise selection or training parameters or whatever, like, bro, when that dude finishes his workout, my man is drenched in sweat yeah. breathing heavy effort and, and fucking intent. loves yeah. it yeah. yeah fucking loves it yeah so understated yeah man you yeah. know did, did was that fucking awesome or not well the thing is like you, you can know? have you know danny's very intricate program or the the traditional five through on whatever but who's ever doing it with the most intent behind yeah what they're doing and effort is who's going to get the best results. Yeah. So absolutely. And it was something it. I needed to hear because yeah. again, you know, like I started out by saying like, I, I was in a very controlled, almost kind of lab type of environment. It was very procedural and it was yeah. very investigative and like, Oh, we, we need to get another four degrees of overhead flexion for this slap tear. So we're going to really figure this out. And then like getting back to the athlete side, it was like, that shoulder flex is good enough. Let's go fucking run. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And yes. I needed to hear that. So it was a very important thing for me. So for like your variability, like let's say that D block. Yeah. We want to do like a single leg RDL. Yeah. What are different things that you do to kind of add variability to make that one singular <laughs> movement, you know, 10 yeah. other things? Number one is going to be path and range of motion. Um, so whether we do it as ipsilateral, contralateral, uh, whether we do it as uh, below the knee to the ground, um, whether it's a crossover, whatever, um, that's going to be number one. Number two is going to be the uh, direction and the speed of load. Mm. So just, you know, I've had you guys have done them too, played around with it. Like, you know, like that uh, that coil strap, right? Mm -hmm. Like throwing that on, adding a lateral vector into the motion that we're doing. The third thing is going to be, I kind of already alluded to it a little bit, but foot position and then load position are going to be the other ones. Um, I won't like switch it up within the set very often, but like if last week we did a two kettlebell single leg, you know, tempo down uh, RDL, next week we're going to go heavy one arm crossover to the pinky toe uh, pattern, right? Nice. So like the week to week is where you're just be. finding wrinkles. 
because I don't think it it fucking matters at all how much any athlete can do on a single leg RDI. I don't <laughs> think that that matters at all. But the ability for the hip to load in extension and with terminal load at multiple positions and angles is very important. Yeah. So rather than just looking at it as last week we were at 50s, hey, grab 55s this week, right? right? Like that's fine if that's what every like if that's what people do, but to me with athletes that are, you know, again, kind of on that back end of the spectrum, like bro, we're fucking hinging. Yep. So let's hinge in a bunch of different ways. And that's really the 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 root of it, you know? So it's nothing any it's nothing any like anything sexy, it's just different. Yeah, I like it. I feel like it's great for your athletes, too, because it's not the same like, all right, single leg RDLs. Let me guess. We're going to go. The reps are going to be lower. We're going to yeah. go heavier yeah. this week. Like, and I think that's a really cool. Way well, to I think you, it's so that. easy to become a prisoner to the to, to did we do more reps or did we go up and wait? Because it elicits a response. Yeah. Well, right? it's easy to say, like, I did a good job because, like, your athletes went up 10 pounds, right. or five pounds and great job. I'm right. Strength. Kit. And if you feel like also, too, like, you know, I you know, a younger version of myself would feel the need to demonstrate that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. To prove to myself I'm doing a good job and yeah. to my athletes that I'm yeah, doing a good job. Week, and to everyone, can someone just tell me I'm doing a good job? <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, but I, I I love the the lens. And I was just having this. So Blennis, Alec Blennis was just, shout out Alec Blennis was just on the show. He gave me this sweet purple shirt. Um, <laughs> this is a nice shirt. And, uh, you know, he's he's someone who's completely unafraid to try new things. And I don't know if you follow him or not. I do. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, that motherfucker is strong. Yeah. I'm still and, recovering. <laughs> Dude, he put me just a little sidebar. He put me through the freaking blender. So I hadn't, I told him, Tim, I hadn't lifted in like two or three weeks, hard in like six months, probably. Yeah. And this guy comes in. He's like, I'm going to lift. I'm like, please say arms and hang out. He's like, oh, I got stiff legged deadlifts, lunges, and all this other, and pendulum squats. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. And we go in there and he's like, probably 40 pounds lighter than me. So I'm like, I have to do his weight. Yeah. Cause if not, people are going to think I'm soft and I'm yep. going to have a bad day. So I tried to keep up with them and dude, I'm still feeling it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Go on, go on. And so I uh, know all the, all that to say again, shout out Alec Blennis is something he said was like mechanical tension, like getting to a place where this is hard. What I'm performing is more yeah. difficult is way more important than necessarily how you got there. And then like on a week to week basis, if you're providing that stimulus and you're giving enough wrinkles that it's just a little bit different, but effectively the same thing's happening. Yeah. It's, you know, that to, that to me sounds very logical and very commonsensical, even though obviously it isn't widely accepted. And I think that, you know, really is the important part of this discussion is that like, and, and I just kind of came to this realization, you know, somewhat recently, but like, I went a very long time with this shit where I was just like, ah, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Like if you do it this way, if you do it that, and I still to, for the most part feel that way. Like I still think almost everything we do is up for interpretation and can be challenged in some way or another. Yeah. But with that being said, it goes into more of like the the personal side or the, the professional development side where it's like, bro, if I never heard that word fascia, I don't know what my career would look like. Yeah. I really don't. And it became transcendent for me. And it led me into this like little niche of injury restoration and return to play and you know, getting lost in connective tissue and, and trying to figure things out. And it like really saturated the field or the job for me and that's what I feel is so important is like, number one, for young strength and conditioning coaches, it's a fucking blank canvas. Yeah. There's, there, we have a decent idea of some big rocks that we know definitively need to be involved in athletic programming. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, man, like just let's figure some things out and then see where your specialty or your interests lie. Strength and conditioning is a very broad terminology. And I, I think about this often, but I wonder how differently the traditionalist approach to SNC would look if we weren't called strength and conditioning coaches and we were called human performance specialists. Right. How would that look? Would that be a different optic? Would that be a different application? Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is like, I was telling you earlier, like, bro, I, I pay my fucking daughter's daycare bill and, and go on vacation based on fascia from fascia. <laughs> that's fucking 
<laughs> bizarre. That is bizarre. And and I have no shame in that at all yeah. because it it you know we we are continuing to legitimize this which and and this is actually here's a here's a quick shameless plug for the the course that Stu and I have coming out mm-hmm. um here in July which is absolutely fantastic. We have kind of like worked our way all the way down, you know, going back and forth for 6 months now, you know, why fascia? What what is fascia? Why does it matter? Yeah. Right? And challenging each other on that question. And what we eventually kind of got down to was like, it's the perspective and the philosophy of what we do. And just understanding that the powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting model is not wrong, but it is an incomplete recipe for athletes. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be some diversification of how we go about training, depending on your setting. And we need to just understand that fascia is not the thing. It's not the next thing. But it's a thing. But it's a thing. Yep. And it's one that has been severely neglected for a long period of time. So now we want to try to do our due diligence in bringing that part to the table and then saying, okay, hey, now we just kind of need to recalibrate loosely where this thing fits in. Because don't forget either, we thought that fucking tendons were inert until the late 80s. <laughs> Yeah. Crazy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like Jake Turo would be living in a fucking homeless shelter. <laughs> he really would, dude. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> I was going to get Honestly, one on him. <laughs> he would be in the woods in Wisconsin. Yeah. He would be just Hunt, fine. Hunting that porcupines and yeah, shit. Yeah. Right. That's right. I saw uh, the porcupine. <laughs> I told him, I was like, dude, your animal content's way better than your tendon content. It is. My um, favorite. Can I go on a Jake uh, rabbit yeah. hole? One of my favorite things that I hope Jake, uh, if you listen to this, which he won't, oh. um, uh, is he would post these stories on his Instagram of just an animal animal eating yeah just like a gorilla eating it. a piece yeah. of bamboo and like you can just hear like real intently like the <laughs> the action of it eating and then the animal would pause and then it would continue <laughs> eating and it was just one of my it's so dumb it's got nothing to do with anything which makes it brilliant uh anyway sorry no but i mean you know that's that's really kind of the 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 point that i'm getting at and and Stu has helped guide me into this and and we've had some really uh incredible dialogue on this over the last few months and and I think that's really the the crusade that we are on. It, and with this course, like if the fast fascia course doesn't convert mm-hmm. the people that are naysayers or dismissive to this, then I then I just don't know what to tell you because first of all, we we <laughs> no one can save them. We, we all we almost <laughs> we almost deliberately like didn't use the word fascia. Like we just tried to like kind of make it a little bit more elusive people. in yeah. and and, and right. keep it, yeah yeah because we want to keep people focused on. And so he's done everything that he's done at such a tremendously high level. And he basically relates the fascial concepts to the movement principles of Altus and of sprinting and so on and so forth. Right. So like I was reading through one of the articles this morning and it's talking about like the two mass model and the spring model and like how that's, you know, the 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 lower leg for elite sprinters is like a complete separating factor. I'm like, oh, well, you don't fucking train the fucking lower leg on a back squat. So, right. Yeah. How important is back squat then? You know, yeah. but it, and I just play the game, man. Like I, it, for ju- for, I just play the game, for, baby. For, for every direction that I get it from, I can send it back the other way because sure. it just it is just discourse, right? That's mm-hmm. the important thing. We're both fucking equally right and wrong. Yeah, none of us know what we're doing, yeah. right? And and the significance of this field is still maturing. Yeah. So I think it's important that we can have healthy dialogue about these things and and not turn it into like fucking memery and like, oh, this is bullshit. And, you know, mm-hmm. like we, we have to be able to have discourse because we are in a juvenile state of our industry and we're all fucking poor. Yeah. And we're overworked. We're objectively overworked, underpaid. We have zero stability, whether you're in the fucking university setting or the private sector. Yeah. You don't know if your next check is coming in the public sector space or in the private sector space where it's coming from. Right. So we have to figure out a way to have a more appropriate and mature conversation, not just about the fascial thing, but all these subtopics. Yeah. Right. Because it's the the irony of it is, is that the group of people that just beat their chest about force and basics, just do the basics, basics, basics. Those are the same people that are ranting on Twitter about how underpaid they are and about how they got skipped over for a promotion and how. And I'm like, bro, you ju- you spent the last fucking three years Telling talking about how the simple your job is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you want people to pay you more money and give you more responsibility. Let's let's think for a second here. <laughs> yeah, right. So if, if we really want to see our role <laughs> as being expansive or as growing or as having a broader application, then, hey. Yeah, learn the basics, 
but don't fucking stick to them. Yeah. Because there's more to this and we can continue to grow where this field is going and we can have a better overall efficacy, not only of practice, but of well-being. And we can make some decent money and we don't have to fucking drive for Uber just to be able to, you know, make make ends meet. Like it's crazy some of the things we hear about. You know, I think, I think, oh, go yeah. ahead. So I think the difference is like are you a strength and conditioning coach or performance coach? Like For if you're sure. just a strength and conditioning coach, like teaching the basics, hinge, squat, whatever, um, is easy and it will get people stronger, progressively overloaded over time. But that's fine for like a gen pop person or somebody yeah. who just wants to get strong and live their life. But if you're going into athletic performance, like that's a totally different set of skills 100%. and things you need to know. So I do think. And if you don't know that, get into athletic performance at a high level and you'll fucking find yeah. <laughs> well, it. Like, if, if just... Or get into real estate. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, you're, one of the two will happen. Like if you're just a strength conditioning coach and that's what you want to be, then you probably should be paid accordingly or compensated accordingly because it's not that hard to teach people it how isn't. to squat. Yeah. And add five pounds every week like it's not rocket science but if you're working with people who are trying to get their second contract yeah. or be an all-american or any of those mm -hmm. things like it's gonna have to be different than a hinge pattern and a squat pattern and five reps this week and three reps reps next week and i can and we can even like kind of just like you know bring it all together on this point here too it's like it's not even just that those are different aptitudes or endeavors it's it's that they're they're inextricably linked because the athletic performance side still requires that fundamental strength and conditioning, totally thing, right? And that's another totally. big fact factor that that Stu and I have been focused on is like stop with the delineation. We, we there's nothing that's fascia specific. There's nothing that's muscle specific. Mm -hmm. There's shit. Yeah. And then we bias it based on how we dress it up or what those training parameters are. And the euphemism that I use for this is like it's like energy systems development. Like we know it's dimmers, not switches. Everything's always doing something, right? So if we change the time parameters of our speed work or of our conditioning work, we are going to bias or emphasize one of those energy systems more specifically. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in training, mm -hmm. where through training parameters, we can have more or less of a bias on musculoskeletal structures or musculotendinous structures, or we can have more bias towards epimuscular connective tissue structures. Mm. Same shit done just slightly differently. Yeah, I mean the same, I, as you're thinking that, I'm like thinking, I'm like, you know, if someone's trying to, you know, run a strength block or if you're trying to peak for speed or whatever, yeah. if that's what you do, it's the same concept. For sure. Yeah, yeah. you're just applying it to the body and, and through that same logic, that same way 100%, of hundred percent, and, and again, like not to beat a dead horse, but like, I just feel like this is something that has been completely remiss and it's, it just is something that we have to educate people on so that we have a better understanding of how the body actually works. So I think this brings up a good point, you saying that, because like what leads people to, to have, um, you know, um, a poor understanding of fascia and its role in the body and its role in movement. And, you know, what isn't fascial training and um, what is fascial training and i know that on some level it like kind of all is you know to a degree yeah, it's I, never not but you know what i mean yeah um can we is there a way that we can get some like um parameters or guidelines or a lens into what would bias us more towards what what it actually is as opposed to like maybe what someone might see on instagram and yeah. it like isn't so for me it is all about the perspective or optics of how the body moves functions performs and then again, just how we organize and we we situate our training, right? Like it's it's a philosophical difference, much much more than it is a practical difference. So I can mm. tell you straight up, like I never at any point delineate the two specifically where I'm like, okay, we got to do some more fascial based shit, today. <laughs> more like, fascial training, never, right? <laughs> never, never, never. But again, it goes back to the squat example, right? I don't bilateral squat my athletes. I don't think it's a great position for them to be in. So now, instead of me looking at the musculotendinous or the skeletal anatomy of pure force output on a back squat, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the way in which the fascial lines are organized and run throughout the body. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing bilateral, we're going to do a split squat. That's the start and stop of the difference. So you what do what you? Yeah, yeah, what do you totally like? Yeah. Like someone coming at it with like all these studies on back squat, max four, blah blah. Why do you? Why would you bias a split squat over a back squat? I've like what things are going through your head when you're like, this is a better selection for the athlete than this. I would venture to say completely arbitrarily here, 80 to 90% of the time that any athlete is in game or in practice, one hip is in flexion and one is in extension. So why do I want to load bilaterally? That's your athletic yeah. stance, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
we never ever at any point have a heel dominant equal distribution of pressure between two feet in sport never so why do i want to do that Mm -hmm. so the change in center of pressure the change in base of support relative to center of mass having one hip inflection and one hip in extension is my justification there even for younger athletes like let's say i got a high school athlete you know we've always done back squat is it better to even introduce that or just start with split squat? I, I you know, man, I, I don't work with that population directly. So I don't, I, I don't know that like it, it really crosses my mind too often. Here's the other thing too. Like, I don't think it's bad. Like I don't think doing yeah. it, I, I fucking back squat, right. you know, yeah. but I don't go out and, and, and get in between the fucking, you know, right. Right. Yeah. There's no second. I think contract. there's a difference. What, like we said, <laughs> there's like no second athletic yeah. per- performance versus just for sure. Trying to be strong. Yeah. And, and, and like, whatever. and that's the other thing too. Like I, I can't express it enough. It's like, if you, if you, if you back squat your athletes, that's cool, man, go do it. I, I could give a fuck at all what anybody <laughs> else. Does. Yeah. I really don't care. Yeah. But if it's me and I have the 13 year old, um, yeah, we'll probably touch some squats just to, cause I think there's a good psychological development for just fucking getting crushed by a back. Squat, totally. You know, yeah. like you just got to feel that load. You totally. got, you know, n- no, diddy. I was going to say no diddy. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're on the right podcast. No diddy indeed, um, But sir. yeah, man, though, so to answer your question, it's like, it's not bad. It's not wrong. It's just not my preference. And I think that there's just going to be a little bit more redeemable value in having them get more proficient from that split squat pattern than that bilateral pattern. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, lo- I just, you know, I think, uh, you know, like people, when, when you ask uh, people philosophical differences on like why they do or don't do something, like I, I, I come to learn, it's like if people have experience to doing something and it works for them and they have a good reason for doing or not doing something, that is a great answer. <laughs> like that's it. Yeah. That's so just that's it. You need. Yeah. That's yeah. it. And, and, and man, I, I told you, I, I put down like 14 pages of notes for you coming down here, um, which I've never done for a podcast. But um, <laughs> that honestly. So here, here was one. That's of, awesome. Here's one of the things that I wrote down, though. Right. Like we, we train robotically and then play chaotically. That doesn't make sense. Say that again. Yep. Why train robotically if we play chaotically? So we're so fucking specific about where their knee angle is and where their hip angle is. And you got to do this. You got to do that. It's got to be. No, 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 my man. That's to develop somebody for improving their back squat, mm-hmm. right? We play in chaos. It's everything. It's everywhere. It's just a multitude of things. So why do we do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like that really to me is is kind of the priority with this. And And again, it goes back to what we were saying a second ago where I don't know shit about shit. I just understand things for how I've experienced them and, and had some success here and there on some things. And I'm just trying to kind of figure that out a little bit more. But from my interest and from what I've looked at and done, I think that we are all bound predominantly by time allotment. So we have to be very specific about how we fill that time. Yeah. And in my and again, in my mind, I want to have one hip inflection and one hip and extension as much of that time as I possibly can. So does that, because when you were mentioning how like you'll do like clean or Olympic variations, that's why you're landing in the split yes. position. Yes. And yeah. you know who I've seen do that at just a freakishly high level is Will Rattel. Yeah. Holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's a unit. He is. So um, give me some scenarios of where like you, you're using athletes and you're putting them in that split stance position. Is it like wherever you can make that happen essentially or... Yeah, for the most part. So I would say, um, you know, the the majority of, of the stance or positions that we're working from is either going to be um, true split stance, kickstand or B or staggered, whatever the fuck you want to call it, right. and then single <laughs> leg. Um, and then with that, we're then going to add in different, you know, surface applications. So, you know, whether that's wedging or whether that's biasing nice. or whether that's on the turf or on the on the platform, um, just utilizing different surfaces is a part of that kind of um progression schematic so to speak but it's you know all of it is is just the same thing it, it's just changing that one that factor, variable you know yeah. so again like today uh today I'd, I'd finished up with like some chops on the kaiser right so instead of just being bilateral and symmetrical and chop 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 mm-hmm. right like i'm just moving so i'm just gonna chop this way this time we'll chop this way this time i'll nice. come up now down low and we're just fucking moving, you know, yeah. and, and like, and, and, you know, I guess this is another good point too. Like another thing that I think about with, with regards to the fascial points is that, um, taking the concept from, from Altus here of, of shapes, patterns, and signatures, um, with this, we are thinking about generating patterns from shapes. 
So in other words, as much as we're able to, with every implement that we have within the training session, we want to think about how we are positioning them to move them to another position as efficiently and as robustly as possible, right? And building on that. So everything should always kind of be under this guise of what are the predominant shapes that we're going to see when they're on the field or on the court? And then what are those patterns that they're generating from those shapes? Mm -hmm. And as Stu mentions in in the course and elsewhere, um, we have hip flexion, we have hip extension, we have foot to ground interaction, and then we have spinal engine patterns. That's it. Mm -hmm. Those are the four. Now he works with sprinters. So for him, it's those four, I think team sport athletes, there's a little bit more to it, but um, at any rate, it's like if what we're doing, how we're positioning them, how we're loading them, what the movement is, as long as it is addressing or touching, you know, all four of those or, or one of those four components, then we're moving in the right direction. Can you go into the spinal engine stuff? That's uh, selfishly. I want to know more about that. Yeah. Um, so have you guys seen the the black and gray video? Of, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. The, my my I when I the first again, this is just me. My shitty attitude. The first thing I think when I saw that, I'm like, because um, first of all, I have a deep appreciation for the spinal engine stuff. I want to premise that before I say what I'm about to say. <laughs> this is oh, this is purely me being an asshole. This is not based in any logical thinking. It's here. Um, but I, I see this person moving, and it's like the it was like it was observed that this person was able to walk effectively by simply, yep. um, you know, utilizing the movement, this reciprocal motion of the and circular motion of the spine. And I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, no shit, he's got no fucking arms and legs. That's the only option he's got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no shit, you know, and and, my, and like, of course, and then again, just me being a dick, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, of course, that's what he did. It was the only move he's got, <laughs> you know, it's the only move he's got. So he figured it out. Um, but uh, again, that's, you know, that's literally me just being, uh, but actually maybe we can use that as a good opportunity to say why that's a terrible way to view it. <laughs> 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 maybe maybe I can tee you up uh, perfectly good. here. Put K tape on your back, right? Yeah. Either side of your spine. Mm. Put your camera down, back facing, and just run a sprint. Yeah. Put it in slow motion. Watch that video, right? There's an inherent reciprocity exchange to locomotion. Okay. So and 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 again, like just so that I'm clear on this, like Stu is very upfront and center about this too, that like the spinal engine in his world is like, that's what can, can take really, really good sprinters and help them become elite. If you can't flex your hip, extend your hip and interact don't your matter. foot to the ground, don't matter. doesn't yeah, mean you're anything. Fucked. You're one yeah. of us. <laughs> Does not mean, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is that preface, but again, like even in ambulatory people, you know, and, and in all athletes in all different sports, there's this re- reciprocity exchange from the pelvic cavity and we're thinking anterior to posterior internal to external but then there's also an above and below reciprocity so the the interaction between the rib cage and the pelvis and the the term for this um you know i guess kind of on that like fascial side or whatever is biotensegrity mm-hmm. right so t- tensegrity principles applied to the body and with where the newtonian principles are all based off of force leverage moments the biotensegrity construct is based off of this distribution between compression and tension and it's a very intuitive thing, like biotensegrity, nitty gritty, well above my fucking level. But the concept of it is very intuitive. Yeah. I go to throw, I'm externally rotating and abducting my arm back, but there's an inherent exchange on my opposite shoulder. Mm-hmm. And then as I go through my follow through, there's an inherent exchange. So I have actually tried to like do away with the term rotation. I think reciprocity. It's a reciprocating pattern. I'm not just rotating as such, Mm -hmm. right? There's an exchange to it. And if you look at any fucking good athlete, like fighters are the best to watch. And I don't know shit about fighting, but like, dude, it's so flowy and like, oh my God. Beautiful. And then boom, it just snaps. It's exactly what you're talking about too. Now let's go put them on the force plate. Let's go put them on the back squat. Let's go put them on the bench. (laughs) Because again, dude, like, and this this, this is the shit that I lose sleep over is I'm like, I, and then I actually, I'll even make it more personal and relative. Uh, I would say that nine out of the 10 Navy SEALs that I train, which is several hundred, I would outlift them. Pick your lift, I'm gonna go outlift them. Mm-hmm. 98% of them would put me in a fucking pretzel Literally, in under a minute. Yeah, for sure, I get it. No shot, Yeah. <laughs> no shot. So how can that occur? 
timing, direction, amplitude, coordination, the ability to connect and maneuver, mm -hmm. perceive and respond. And these are all of these elements that just keep kind of falling into this thread that we're trying to untangle here. And so for a lot of it, it, yeah, man, it sucks that we don't have more concrete evidence or direct answers for some of these things, but a lot of this is very intuitive. Yep. And if you just think about like, okay, instead of me doing a very strict, sturdy landmine press with a perfect arm, at, just fucking throw the thing, just <laughs> yeah. don't press it. And, and do it how it feels natural to you. Nothing is isolated. Integrate everything and utilize every fiber in your body for every exertional movement that you're gonna do. Dude, I hate that we're running out of time here because I'm just having so much fun. I need that part too. But I know, right? <laughs> but but because you've you came fucking so prepared, I I want to make sure that there's nothing that we miss on um, before we start like going through like our closing stuff and our segments. Can I selfishly ask one? Yes, please. This is what I've used. So we talked about you know healthy athletes, what you're doing. Let's talk about like injured athletes, like. A common injury is obviously like a sprained ankle. So let's just do a scenario: sprain my ath or sprain my ankle in practice. See you tomorrow. What yeah. are the things you would do day by day, week by week? So the first thing is is fluid and sensory, right? And and there's the the fascial component. There is that the per you know relative comparisons, the fascial tissue is suggested to have about six to ten times the amount of proprioceptive bodies as compared to muscle. Wow. So it, the the analogy or euphemism here is like, think about how cars are made now, right? Like everything has a sensor. It's constantly detecting what the internal and external environments are. And then we get a signal when we have a flat tire, right? So the body is similar to that. I feel good. I feel good. I tweak my ankle. Boom. Now all of a sudden my brain is saying my foot hurts. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to try to downregulate the nociceptive response, try to get them out of pain. When you're in pain, we are driving sympathetic response. We don't have trust in what we're doing. So everything that we're gonna do is, come, is gonna come with a, return, or a reduced cost, exactly, apprehensive tension. Um, number two is gonna be the fluid. If, if excessive edema is present, progress can't be made, right? I, I know my sports science people, well, inflammation is, yeah, yeah, I get it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, edema, yeah. Edema. <laughs> right, um, <laughs> literal fluid, yeah. We, we need to push that, right? So <laughs> we need to get that fluid moving and we need to kind of um, you know look to try to move the lymph really more than anything else to help kind of clean the shit out and get the things going. So then from that point, it goes into standard ankle sprain RTP, right? Like there's there's not anything really sexy about it. There's not anything magical about it. The difference that I would say that I'll take is that, um, so when we think about general performance, we think about sports performance, we think about the funnel. We start very, very wide, and then we just narrowly work down into this very specific thing that we're gonna you know, kind of finish or peak with. For injuries, flip it. Start very specific, very isolated, very narrow and then work your way back to reintegrating them into the multitude of things that we would normally be doing. The other thing that is um, you know, pretty much inherent for me is like whether you're day one, severe ankle sprain, um, or your day 40, Achilles tendon uh, you know, uh, restructure, um, we wanna keep you as theoretically close to what you would be doing for that time point of the year as we possibly can if your injury didn't happen or if you didn't have your injury. So as close to that as we can possibly get. So really for the ankle sprain, we're going to start out with like general rudiments. We're going to reintroduce spring ankle series. We're going to do some foot compression stuff. We're going to do some release stuff, right? And then we start to kind of go into our main session. So that session that we described earlier, we'll say it's the same fucking thing, right? So maybe they're not ready to do their 65% high velocity split squats, but we can certainly load with some dumbbells and we can do it at a moderate tempo, right? So the same thing that you would normally be doing, do that. All the modalities, all the fluff, all the LMT stuff, the voodoo floss, it's great. It works, it does what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't solve the problem. The problem is solved through load and velocity. So we need to facilitate that as best as we possibly can. The load and velocity thing is huge for a return to play. I think we just look at, strength numbers of the load end and don't realize velocity is like the biggest thing for it, absolutely play. dude yeah. and and i would even just add quickly to that the chaos yeah like we because if they if they see it in sport we experience it in training so before i'm in a position where i'm i'm confident to clear that athlete like hey we're good to, we're good to go we're good full back I, we got to do some shit, man. Like we got to, we got to really get dirty a little bit, you know, because I want to be able to catch the vulnerabilities or the deficiencies before I go back to, if I'm in the university setting coach, Hey, he's good to go. She's good to go. Right. And then they're not good to go. And they're not. Right. Yeah. Like, I want to be the one that's like, okay, they're not ready yet. You yeah. Know? And I kind of pull back. But to the point, it's like, 
that's the and this complete full circle here. That was what we found at VHP. The best recipe for soft tissue injuries, for orthopedic injuries, for metabolic diseases, the best recipe in the world is fantastic individualized strength and conditioning, priority on nutrition, priority on soft tissue management, and fucking sleep. Yeah. That's the best thing in the world that anybody can do for any injury, barring the fucking obvious. All right. So that to me is is like what real RTP or rehab is. It's not, we have to do single leg balance and then we have to get eversion to 22 degrees yeah. before, man, just train. Yeah, yeah. Support it and then train it and then manage it. Yeah. Um. Danny, is there anything that we haven't covered that you've got like a burning desire that you want to touch on or speak on before we start to wrap things up here? Next time, tag me. <laughs> Next time, tag you in what? The Fashion Crusade. <laughs> <laughs> I, dude, I will. I have to now. Incredible. No, nah, man. Um, Next time, tag me. <laughs> nah, it, uh, uh, no, nah, this was awesome, man. I think, um, you know, again, I really appreciate you guys having me down. Uh, I've been loving the channel. I've been loving what you guys are doing. Um, you know, obviously we were just able to get introduced today, but, you know, Zach and I have been, um, you know, going back and forth for a long time now. And it's just really cool to see what you guys are doing. Uh, I think it's absolutely great work. And, and I love the no filter nature to this and we can just have good conversations. But yeah, man, I mean, I think as far as I'm concerned, like I, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. You know, I'd never in a million years thought that this is what I was going to be doing. Like, you know, and, and I can't overstate it enough. It's like, it, it still fucks me up sometimes. I'm like, dude, if you told me five years ago that like I was going to be injuries and fashion, I would have told you you're out of your mind and living in Texas nonetheless. <laughs> what a blessing. You know? Yeah. You know, and, and real quick, before we jump into these segments, what did you think you were going to be doing? Man, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And that kind of, that's a little bit of a like kind of scary thing to touch on because, you know, there's really a, a, a bifurcation within this as well, where it's like it, it up front, you know, when I was a bag of shit 20 year old and I didn't fucking know anything about anything. Um, dude, I don't know what I could have done outside of this. I really don't. Right. I sucked at everything. Yeah. Um, and nothing interested me. Like it was never really enriching. And and then we get to VHP and then we get to this point and it's like, man, if I just didn't bang weights, I don't know what the fuck I would have done. And then we get to VHP and it's like, if I didn't meet those people and if I didn't have that, you know, type of application with the injury stuff and then I don't know, man, I would have gotten burnt out, I feel yeah. like, because to me, it's just not that stimulating without these things. And that's just my story, my thing. But, you know, now it's like, man, I'm just seeing all these different opportunities and these different applications and how from an entrepreneurial standpoint, like I can organize and arrange my life exactly the way that I want to. And I can tell, you know, people when I can and can't do something and I don't have to get clearance able to just come down here because I wanted to, you know, right. like that, do, dude, do the show. We work, in, we work in fucking pajamas. Like, <laughs> like, how could this be any better? Tell people everything that sucks about them. And I get to stand here and yeah. just like, you know, do some Instagram posts. Like, it's a good this deal. Tight. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have been a bad real estate agent. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. bro. Terrible. Dude, buy the house or not, man. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what to fucking tell you, man. It's got hardwood it's floors. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, can, you, can, you, can you afford it? No. Well, then let's fucking look yeah, around. I don't know. Here? Uh, Danny, we've got some segments here. Uh, I'm going to do squat wedges. God. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. I'm going I'm to do it. All right, this is three things. This is brought to you by Squat Wedgies. Three things that someone can do, no matter where they're at, to position themselves to get to the place where you're at today. Um, be hungry, be curious, and talk to people. Um, and I think that third part was the one that was the most challenging for me. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because like, and th this is just spoken from like a, an extremist bipolar dude, like I'm either <laughs> I'm there or I ain't there. <laughs> There's no middle ground. Um, so if I, if I have interest in something, I, I become obsessive about it. It becomes a manic focus. And that part of it was easy. Hard was easy. The part that was difficult for me was figuring out how to utilize communication and networking as a means for facilitating what's interesting and, and important to me. Mm. I know how to call people and get an answer on something specific. That's very easy. But what the difference is, is when you start to utilize those less transactionally and more intimately and develop a true relationship with people, then that all of a sudden leads to these three other things. Yeah, totally. And then those three other things lead to something. And then now all of a sudden you have this like kind of full circle moment. It's like, wow, okay, cool. 
So that would be the three simple things that I would suggest. God, those are fucking great. Yeah. Uh, next segment brought to you by Plow Matt. Best Plow Matt in the world. <laughs> All right, this is rant and rave. Okay. Anything you want to rant about? Anything you want to rave about? <clears throat> oh man, that's a real left field question. Normally, well, yeah. Uh, and it, it, let's let's make it specific. So let's oh, do it. Come on. Yeah, let's do it to. Uh, uh, let's we, rant about what people uh, hate on faster training for. <laughs> <laughs> we we only got so, so much time, so don't. Yeah. Let me rave. Okay. Um, I, it's more my speed. Anyway. I think. Um, I think you know, like I said a minute ago, uh, I, I'm in the phase of my life where I'm going to look back on this particular phase. Yeah. all the way through right and it's we were talking about it with yeah, coffee earlier um it's never i've never had a transitional moment in my life that has been so palpable and visceral and like i'm conscientious of like holy shit my life is changing dramatically right now and normally it's like you're lost in the clouds something happens oh shit i got a raise like you know now, now life's different and, and for me it's like every single day um, you know, every single week, man, like it's something new, something else is coming down the pipeline. And I'm just really, really grateful for that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and making a point of it re and relating it to what we talked about here today, you know, so again, kind of speaking mostly to the, the younger crowd here, like, man, you're in charge, man, your path, your compass. And, and if you're just able to be fucking defiant enough <laughs> and curious enough to figure out what you love and then be willing and able to pursue that relentlessly, man, fucking anything can happen. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, like I'm not sitting here like I'm some fucking person of interest or important or anything, but what I'm doing right now relative to me is very good. And it was just this, you know, long, long process that all of a sudden, boom. Well, there's a saying that I'm a big fan of and it says, um, suddenly isn't all, you know, yeah. isn't so all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, suddenly, yeah. suddenly is the culmination Yep. Of like in your case, what you're speaking to yeah. years of passionate, relentless pursuit. And, and, you know, like it, I'll never forget this conversation I had. I was at a wedding, unfortunately up in New York, uh, <laughs> like eight years ago, um, <laughs> we're in fucking Manhattan or something, some millionaire's house. And, and I had no business being there. And like, you know, these like stock investors are trying to like loop me into the conversation because I obviously stick out and <laughs> they're like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm strength and conditioning coach. And like, and I'll never forget this, man. This motherfucker like kind of like leaned down and like leaned into me and was like, oh, wow, that's so noble. Fuck. I'm like, oh, you motherfucker. Yeah, you're a dead man. <laughs> like, you I never, like I never forgot that because yeah. it was like, oh, shit. So like to people who really aren't in touch with SNC, like they think what we're doing is like charity work. Yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna make a point out of that one, yeah. you know? So it's Fuck those yeah. things. And like, and I was so terrible in school, struggled mightily with everything, personally struggled a lot. Yep. And then like, you just, you stick with that. Don't fall into this trapping of like, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and you, you have to show up looking a certain way. Like, man, just go do what you wanna do, detest, people that fucking tell you otherwise do it ethically don't fuck anybody else up right and just accumulate man god i love that you get the last one okay yeah, i got the last one okay this one is not sponsored by anybody yet uh rude rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rude rock. this next we'll this, talk after this yeah that's right this next segment is sponsored to you by rude rock um this is called unsolicited advice unsolicited okay solicited advice yeah. um here's the scenario um you just got into collective it's your first time being here you're like damn this place is sick it really there's is. someone sitting up next to you uh and the squat rack and you are so taken by the moment that you feel compelled to lean over into that next squat rack and just whisper some unsolicited advice into this person's ear what is it well you know what it is not split squat give us some better <laughs> advice <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's another, these are seriously random. Like no, yes, normally dude. these are pretty predictive. These are really, really random. Um, unsolicited advice to somebody who I don't even have an archetype for. Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to go Jake Tura and just say by program. I, I mean, fucking love that. By answer. fashion mechanics. There's there we go. Advice. No, man, uh, we'll keep it training on this one since I'm getting all heavy on the life stuff. Um, open your mind, do, do different things. You don't have to do everything the way you've been told you have to do. It's not this like very specific robotic type of thing. If your training isn't fun, your training is wrong. It, for non-athletes, 
for sure. If, yeah. if your training is not enjoyable, then you're not doing the thing right, right? Yeah. Like you can fucking push hard and enjoy it. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to hate it. Yeah, man. Like do some different things, like try that. some different things out. You know, if, if you're, again, if you're in that kind of middle age, used to be an athlete crowd, run, sprint, not run, sprint, mm -hmm. like plyo sprint. It's very, very important. Um, your tendons and your fascia will thank you in the long run. Um, and yeah, man, it's, it's much more of an open, open book than it is, you know, this, this specific script of shit you got to do. Dude, you, um, you're blowing up right now. So I want you to tell, where can people find you? Where can they consume your content? And then t tell them where they can train with you, yeah. what they can be on the lookout for everything. Yeah. So I'm on all the things. Um, it, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I feel like I'm being pushed away from Twitter a little bit, but, uh, Instagram at, at Danny Rude Rock, I think, um, we have our Rude Rock strength, uh, uh, handle as well. Um, we're building out our YouTube channel. So we have a good, you know, nice. pretty good start there. Rude Rock strength. Uh, and then our website as well, Rude Rock Strength. Uh, but really, honestly, coming up, uh, we have this course with with Stu um, that'll be releasing on July first, and and this thing is really beautifully done. And and you know, I, I really give all and, and the credit to him um, in just discussing this in a very eloquent and a professional and pragmatic way that is directly actionable. I get so fucking long winded and it's so dense and lost and ambiguous in some of my things. This is very clear, very cut and dry. This is the fascial component. This is the fast component. Here's what you need to do. Go do that. I think it's going to be a brilliant course. It's marketed at $60. So it's, you know, very affordable. Um, I, I would be on the lookout for that. I think that thing's gonna be fantastic. And it's got a fucking cool name, Fast Fashion. Yeah, baby. yeah. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> that sounds sick. All right, Danny, you're the fucking man. I Thank you for it, coming bro. down here. Dude. This was man. so much fucking fun. I yeah. wish we had another hour. No, this was um, great. It was. I, I'm, I'm gonna listen to it back. Take notes. We had some <laughs> yeah, bombs uh, in there. Yeah, man. we got some bangers. We're gonna get some <laughs> sick clips out of this. <laughs> to anyone who made it this far, thank you so much for hanging out with us, watching, listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.